It's finally Seattle Mariners time. We, we were teasing this for a while on the call up and uh, we finally finished the Seattle Mariners top prospect list. I'm Arm Layton. He's Jack McMullen. And this is a fun list because we got to update it or at least finish it. We've been working on it for a little bit, but we got to finish it with the three first round picks being inserted in there, which is a very rare opportunity uh, for the Mariners. And then also, they've had some players just playing at a really high level of late uh, in terms of just how well they've been playing. It's at the lower levels, uh, low A and high A, but they've been playing extremely well. So this is all of a sudden, you know, it's not an elite system, but it just got a lot more fun after Jerry Depoto depleted it uh, over the last couple of years. I think it's gotten better. And, and yes, depleted because, you know, Noel V. Marte was on the move and Williamson was on the move and Williamson's stock has dropped since he left the Mariners system. And, um, you, you know, you had a couple other guys like Jake Fraley, I think was like a top 20 prospect for them at, at the time. Edwin the Arroyo. Arroyo, uh, yeah. Phillips. Yep, Connor Phillips as well. Um, well, Austin Shenton was a Mariner at, at a certain yep. point as well. So, yeah, I mean, he, he sent those guys out, but the marquee ones – have already graduated from prospect status. I was looking at the top prospects for the Mariners in 2021 and the guys that they have had. Because when we first like started just baseball, the Mariners were so far and away the best system in baseball. Oh, yeah. Because it was Julio Rodriguez, it was George Kirby, Logan Gilbert, Cal Raleigh, all of which have become... Kelnick. Kelnick. All of which have become very solid big leaguers. One of them broke his foot out of frustration, but the rest are you know playing consistently. So... I mean, it, it's it's fascinating to see like how quick the turnaround is for those quote unquote best systems in baseball. Because the White Sox, like the White Sox, still haven't turned it around from having the best system in baseball when it was Moncada and Kopech and Cease and Nick Madrigal. Like, where did that go? The Mariners, their ability to replenish this quickly via the draft, via international free agency, and, and striking gold with some guys that are like diamonds in the rough is a testament to them. I think they've done a really good job with this. Uh, took a while for us to get it out. I guess there was like a draft and a futures <laughs> game and I did a bunch of minor league baseball happening too. So please yeah. forgive us. Yeah, there, there, there was quite a bit. And and we're kind of simultaneously shoring up the top 100 list uh, to, to get that rolling by the end of the month. So I think that's going to come out right after the deadline so it doesn't get buried, but you know we're, we're well along on that. But to kind of wrap up on your point before we go into the names to watch and then the top 15, you bring up an excellent point, which was you know a lot of the system, a lot of the reason why the system is, is quote-unquote depleted now. And, and I, I know that sounds negative. It's not. like they, it's, That's what you do. You graduate prospects to the big leagues, and you trade some to yeah. get good big leaguers with control like Luis Castillo. But and also identify – identifying the right ones to part with you know noel v Marte may be a fantastic big leaguer he might be but they parted with him instead of you know somebody else uh maybe one of their younger starters maybe they could have won a bunch of different ways they part with Marte and arroyo arroyo is not going to be on our top 100 update he's still a very good prospect but just kind of to put it in perspective there and Marte has looked really good of late in triple a but he has all of the same questions that he had when they traded him um, if not some more, uh, it's not even Kenny play shortstop. It's he's not playing shortstop. And there's, you know, there's little, little aspects to that as well. So identifying the right guys to part with too is, is important. And Williamson has salvaged his stock as now kind of hanging around as a big league starter. But I mean, that was a guy that I loved, you know, Brandon Williamson, I thought was one of the better left-handed pitching prospects in the game. I was, I was really, really, really high on him. Uh, but again, it's nice to see him still carve out a big league role, but it's easy. You could definitely say they sold high on Williamson when they did trade him. Yeah, I think so. And, and Williamson, like, yes, is he put together a solid string of starts? Mm -hmm. Has he been heavily protected? Yes. Last two starts, he's gone 12 innings, three runs. That's been great. But he started so poorly through 12 starts in his major league career. This guy's got a 4-6. Yeah. Um, so Williamson... I, I think the Reds are fine with him being a part of the rotation now, but when Lodolo and Green come back and Phillips is ready and then you have Abbott, is Williams in your five? No, they're probably going to go pay a five in free agency on a one-year yeah. deal, a two-year deal. You know, If they can get a three-year deal guy, they'll go do it. So I, I think they totally ID'd what they don't need in, in a, as good a way as possible. Yeah. Noel V. Marte can become a good third baseman. We've talked about this. 
I watched him play third base for a week in Louisville. He looked very uncomfortable. Yeah. Like it's, it's he's just a big that dude, dude. He's a big ass dude. Like he doesn't move that great. I know. So when you look at this Mariners team and like what's coming down the bent, I think that they moved from a spot where they felt like they had a surplus or a big leaguer that was going to be there. JP Crawford signed a five year deal. I know that JP Crawford is not a top 10 shortstop in baseball, but you found an average major league shortstop on a five year deal. You didn't yeah. need Noel V. Marte to be like thrusted into a shortstop position at 22 years old. And I think they ID'd that very well. 100%. So let's jump into it. And we'll, we'll start with the names to watch and, you know, guys that kind of just missed the top 15 or just relevant prospects. And of course, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see, you know, kind of follow along with the names and the scouting grades. If not, we will you know, kind of write those or we'll read those out to you and, and let you know as we get further along. We'll kind of fly through the names to watch because this is where the system still is kind of thin. It's just not that deep. Uh, you got Walter Ford, right-hand pitcher. He was her second-round pick, prep guy. He's barely thrown. I, I don't know if he's been banged up. The velo, from what I've seen in the, from you know behind the hood or beneath the hood, the data-wise, it's been kind of fluctuating. Uh, so, you know, Ford, will kind of just got to wait and see, but obviously he's he's relevant. Teddy McGraw, recently drafted. Uh, Wake Forest is... You know, Wake Forest is one of those those schools that just churns out talent. So anytime an arm comes out of there, like it's it's interesting. Teddy McGraw, 70 and two thirds at Wake in 2022, <clears throat> put up some pretty solid numbers. I think there's there's some stuff to to look forward to. The breaking ball is good. The fastball can get pretty high up there. I, I like I like it here because again, we've kind of seen that this is a guy that probably could have been a, a high high round pick, maybe first or second round pick. But you have the Tommy John, and, and that was his second, right? That was his second since, TJ since 2019. Yeah, that's obviously alarming. Uh, but I think they felt like the upside here in that round was was enough to to snag. So I was reading a couple things that said McGraw impressed more than Rhett Lauder did this past fall. Like he was sitting 97 with a wipeout slider. So if you have pure stuff that's better than the – Louder went eighth, better than the eighth overall pick, I mean, you're doing something right. But, you know, a, a twice-reconstructed UCL in the span of four years is is super alarming. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at some of the game logs from the last time we saw him throw, which was, you know, back in 2022, and uh, some dominant outings on the Cape too. Uh, he pitched a couple outings out there and was and was crazy. Uh, he had six innings at eight Ks, which you, it just doesn't happen that often on the Cape. Like, to go that deep and, and dominate like that, fastball was in the mid-90s. So if, if the stuff's anything close to that, it's a great pick. It's worth a shot there. Ben Williamson – Third baseman, four-year William and Mary guy. That's an underrated team, by the way. William and Mary, yeah. like underrated baseball school. Williamson put up video game numbers. Doesn't strike out. It's a very analytically driven school for a mid-major as well. And uh, it's a sneaky pick of a guy that could have just been under the radar at a mid-major school. I kind of comped it to uh, a later round. Shanwell uh, Williamson went with third round, I think. Uh, no, fifty seventh overall. Like Angels took Shanwell eleventh. They took the best hitter at the mid major level. Um, Jacob Wilson was up there too at a Grand Canyon. He went six to Oakland. That's like another great hitter at the mid major level. If you find a guy that's what hitting three ninety one with a six sixty slug at, at the mid major level, it, it's worth a shot. At fifty seven, I'm not sure. We'll find out. 90% zone contact. The the EVs were pretty darn strong too. I, I think this could be a, a really sneaky get there uh, with, with Williamson. Axel Sanchez, 20-year-old shortstop uh, from the DR. He put up great numbers at the complex last year and now kind of just getting his feet wet, you know, at the lower levels. We'll see how, how he develops. Again, just a guy that's kind of far off. Uh, Michael Morales is there's not that many arms left in this system. And so Morales is one of the, the, the few that have some, some intrigue. That's the one frustrating part with this system at this point. And, you know, one of the guys that we ranked here is technically graduated as the, as we finish the list, which we'll get to. So it, it's thin pitching wise. Morales is not even 21 years old yet though. Low nineties fastball, pretty good slider, decent curve, and still trying to find the change, but he's got a potential for a solid four pitch mix here. Potentially uh, Cade Marlowe. He, he, Got up to the big leagues. I, I, is he is he now still there with uh, Kalnick having the foot thing? Yeah, first big league hit last night for Cade Marlowe ah. and first big league bag. And that's kind of Cade Marlowe's game. If he can swipe bags, he's going to have a spot on a major league roster for a good bit. Yeah, and, you know, 
26 years old, fourth outfielder type, but he, the EVs are pretty decent. You talk about the speed, you talk about all the little things he can do. I think this guy's got a, a big league role there, and, and, and it's nice to see like what he's been able to do in the upper levels and just kind of hit his way up to getting an opportunity. Zach Deloche is a guy I saw plenty of on the Cape, but he actually won the the batting title on the Cape, just edging out Nick Gonzalez. And you know, Deloche is somebody that doesn't really have anything that jumps off the, the page. There's there's not really one plus tool. There's not that many above average tools, but there's not really a massive hole in his game at the same time. Uh, he, he makes enough contact, slightly above average exit velocities, uh, really good approach. He's kind of that fringy big leaguer type guy too. Uh, he doesn't have the dynamic athleticism as Marlowe, so it's kind of hard to figure out where he would slide in. But he seems more like just kind of a depth piece, but yeah. a pretty solid one. Yeah. And then last but not least on the other names to watch is Prelander Baroa. Baroa is uh, <clears throat> pretty electric, but the problem is he just doesn't really know where it's going. I had a lot of people like asking me about him before the year. Uh, because of just the stuff and fastball that averages 97 nasty slider, but the fastball shapes kind of, eh, the command's not great. The slider's disgusting. That's enough to, to keep him in a bullpen, but he's got to, you know, at least find fringy command. He's walking 17% of batters between the minor leagues and the major leagues this year, striking out 35.5%. It's pretty good, but he's going to find a way to uh, throw some more strikes, but he could be a really good high leverage reliever. He's still just 23 years old and a young 23. Yeah, all you got to know about Baroy is this guy had a sub three ERA over a hundred innings last year, so there was some serious intrigue, and the Mariners still like relegated him to a bullpen role because the command is that hit or miss. So yep. I think they ID'd this guy as a future closer. It feels like the Brash trajectory, where Brash was a good starter in the minor leagues and looks like a setup guy moving forward. Um, I think that's probably what we're looking at with Prelander Baroa. Yeah, uh, I think that's right around the same lines. Uh, Brash has that outlier pitch, which helps. But Baroa's slider is you know, not quite outlier. It's pretty damn good, though. And with a little bit of better command, he can definitely be a good piece. Speaking of a guy that you know is pretty much settled into a bullpen role and, and looks like a big league reliever, that's number 15 on our, our top 15 here is, is Isaiah Campbell. I know a guy that you you saw a little bit when you were on the Cape, right? And somebody that there's no denying the arm talent, 95 miles an hour with the fastball up to 97, 98, good shape on it. And another really good slider, but also just solid command. And that's the big thing with Campbell now is those two pitches. He's going to pound the strike zone. They're both above average to borderline plus. And he looks, he just looks like a seventh inning guy. Like that's a really solid outcome. I think here for Campbell, who's battled injury issues, who's, you know, had a little bit of ups and downs. The other thing I really like is, I always get frustrated with the relievers that are strikeout or, or long ball, you know, the, the, the high fly ball relievers when he's not striking you out, he's getting a lot of ground ball, 60% ground ball rate that, that, that always bodes well. And, and that's, that's definitely something that I think is going to help him be a consistent reliever as well. For sure. And he's never really walked guys. I mean, he's been consistently <clears throat> two and a half walks per nine, which, which I really appreciate there. So Campbell, I think, can be that two-inning reliever when you're down by one, down by two. And, and that is a top 15 prospect in this system. I didn't see Isaiah Campbell on the Cape, but I loved him as a starter at Arkansas in 19. Okay. He was one of the better starters in America in, in 19 mm -hmm. with Arkansas, but he was a senior at that point. Seniors, it, it's like being a sophomore in college basketball. If you're a sophomore, your value is halved compared to, like, your freshman year, right? Yeah. Because, oh, you're one year older. Like, damn, boo-hoo. Um yeah. Campbell was a really good pitcher as a senior, much like what Quinn Matthews at Stanford just did this year. Yeah, he was a senior. Like he's not a first round guy because he's not a junior. Yeah, a hundred percent. And <clears throat> it's been awesome to see him kind of just turn into a big leaguer you know, before our eyes here. Yeah, fourteen is unfortunate here in Taylor Dollar, the guy that probably could be a lot higher after the year that he had last year. Right handed pitcher was kind of that breakout prospect of the system i would say at least on the pitching side last year and one of the biggest breakout pitching prospects in in baseball last year he was dominant he pitched to a 225 era and 144 innings at double a unfortunately out for the season with a labrum surgery and he only made three appearances three starts this year the velo is down and i think that was probably the tell dollard it's there's there's nothing that jumps off the page stuff wise but you know, 
the slider is really, really, really good. Um, did I say change up the first time? I think so. <laughs> yeah, my bad. The slider is really good. I mean, he dominated hitters with that pitch. And then the fastball, it's low 90s, but it gets on you a little quicker than you think. And he kind of just tunneled those pitches really well. Then would mix in the change up on occasion. But it was the slider that he really leaned on. We'll see how he comes back from labrum. Shoulders are always scary. Only time I talk record is when it's crazy. How does a minor leaguer have a 16 and two record? Yeah, that, that's nuts. I but he was a walking quality start last year. It, it, and like, if you're a quality start, you're going to win games, obviously. Like we've seen that with Framber Valdez. Hell, we saw that with Kyle Wright last year, right? Like Kyle Wright was not better than Max Fried, but he was a 20 game winner because he was a quality start every time. So Taylor Dollard, if you're throwing six innings in May in the minor leagues, you're you have the chance to win 10 games he went 16 and 2 i don't know how that works also absolute party in the back from taylor dollar oh yeah on youtube crazy yeah. like dyed hair on the <clears throat> mullet flow type thing going on i it's got a joe dirt feel <laughs> and i'm okay with that yeah it was it was an awesome look it was it was pretty pretty and when he's spinning those sliders at you uh, real quick, one one thing I want to like highlight on how good the numbers were on that slider as I pull up my notes here. It was pretty absurd what he was able to do with that last year. So fastball sat 91 to 93. Sliders in the 79 to 81 range. He threw the slider more than his fastball. There were 48% of the time. Landed it for a strike 70% of the time and held opponents to a 166 batting average. At a 31% K rate. To, to land a slider that frequently for a strike and get that much whiff is pretty absurd. Yeah. No, I mean, it's unfathomable at that point, especially when you have, like, I'm not going to say not a good fastball, but not it's great. Not, it's not yeah. great. Like, it's not, it's not a data darling fastball yeah. in the slightest. So if you can dominate with a slider, what do you think he is? You think he's a backhand starter? I think he's a kind of a swingman type. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, and again, wish him a speedy recovery. Shoulders are tough. Yeah. 13. Here's a data darling for you. Lazaro Montes, outfielder slash DH. I think he'll probably end up being more of the DH stash him in right type. He's a monster. He's 6'4", 210 pounds at 18 years old. <laughs> he signed for $2.5 million. And I mean, he's already hit a ball 118.4 miles per hour this year, which is absurd. He has cut the strikeouts down. From 33% at the DSL last year to the high 20s this year. I know Montes gets you going, but there is a ton of whiff to be worried about here. Yeah, don't care. 118, don't care. <laughs> I've seen, like, he hit a ball crazier than I've seen a dude hit a ball, like, at a complex ever. Um, yeah. Getting video of that, and I, I'm probably biased because I got, like, the best video mm -hmm. angle in all of sports. Lefty bat going pull side and the video is flanked a little bit to the left of home plate where you can actually see the ball take off is like the most aesthetically pleasing video you can possibly watch. And yeah. that's how I ingested that 118 mile an hour Homer the first time. And I was like, I think this guy might be Barry Bonds. <laughs> Unfortunately, a ton of in zone with, but he has gotten marginally better. The power, as you mentioned, like it's majestic. And even if the hit tool is a 30, I think there's enough power where there is some sort of role for him. So the other thing, he's definitely the, a relevant prospect. He's still extremely young. The other thing, man, like he's walking, dude. Like he's got a 450 OBP in 30 games of the complex. That's that's now, the recipe. If you're going to whiff a lot, don't chase, crush mistakes. And there's a role. There's a platoon DH out corner outfield role for you. For sure. Number 12, we get into the recently drafted players, and this is the third of the three first-round picks. It's Ty Pete, shortstop, 30th overall pick, a guy that admittedly, you know, I'll kind of tell you who I've gotten more looks at, who I've gotten less looks at, and the next two, unfortunately, like impossible to get much look, many looks at. Ty Pete, though, really good athlete, was a legitimate two-way prospect, but looks like the Mariners prefer him as a shortstop. Very, very raw. One of the younger players in the draft class, 17 years old, but – monster arm uh, even if he can't stick it short he's got great wheels so he can make an impact in the corner it could be a good third baseman and and there's plus power to dream on here this is like a project and i think you know with your third first round pick it's fine to shoot for the project and go for a high high upside player here who obviously has a wide range of outcomes
He's six two. He's kind of rail thin at this point. And when you see six two shortstop, you can dream on so much more. Um, this was number three in terms of the three picks in seemingly rapid succession. They went Colt Emerson at twenty two, who we'll get to. Uh, then you went Farmelo at twenty nine, who we'll get to, and then Pete at thirty. Yes, yeah. you. I, I think I mentioned it at the time. Like I wish they went college with one of them. Yeah. But three high schoolers, I, if you can dream on the ceiling, chances are one of them is going to get somewhat close to it. Of the limited video I could get, you know, it's mostly like perfect game events, stuff like that. There was definitely, you know, a, a fair amount of whiff there. But again, you're getting a 17 year old crazy upside, third of, of three first round high school picks. And the other two are definitely higher floor. So this was kind of like, the let's swing for the fences. We got three of these kind of move and, and I don't hate it. Number 11 is a guy that if, if you tell me you've seen a lot of felony and Celestin, you're lying to me uh, unless you are legitimately a D, you know, Dominican scout, uh, unless you are literally sent to the Dominican to watch these players, you have not seen felony and Celestin. That yeah. said, I've seen a few videos and I've just been able to dig up whatever we can dig up. And I mean, you can see why he signed for $4.7 million. You can see why evaluators that did go to the Dominican Republic to see him absolutely love him and think he can be a special, special talent. Uh, $4.7 million in January, that's big money, especially the, the Mariners. They ID these guys pretty well. They do well in international free agency. And switch hitter, great tools across the board. And all I was able to see were, were some swings and, and some defense. You can see the twitch and the swing. It's an advanced swing for his age. I, I'm buying what, what the evaluators are selling here. I, I can't add too much of my own perspective, but there's a lot to like with Celestin. I don't know anything about Philly and Celestin. I'll be honest and, there. And when I yeah, think it, that, that's the thing, too, is like I see him like number five, number six on top prospects. So maybe, like maybe he is there. Like maybe he is that good, but I can't comfortably put him in the top 10 if I haven't seen him and right. that's just kind of where I'm at, but so, I, I'm very prepared to, to move him up very quickly. So when I, when I see like big ticket international free agent guys, um, you know, obviously I think Soto was a huge ticket free agent guy, but yes, yeah, Antuna was a big ticket free agent guy. Wander Franco was a big ticket free agent guy, I think. Um, but Robert Poisson was, was a big ticket free agent guy. So, I, it's so hard for me to see that f nearly $5 million is committed to a 16 year old, just because you have no idea like what's going to happen. Uh, yeah. Ethan Salas is already off the complex. Celestin, it remains to be seen like what happens here. So I'm not, I'm not saying that he's the Poisson when you compare it to a Wander Franco, but um, I don't know. It's, it's just a, it's more of a crapshoot than $5 million leads on. Yeah. What I do like is, you know, you look at the Poissons, you like the Armenteros, like those kind of guys. It was toolsy, let's hope he hits. And I think that approach has been adjusted a bit now to like yeah. the good feel to hit and the other tools are solid too. Let's hope those other tools develop because he's 17. A la Salas. I think Celestin's cut closer to that cloth, which I like those IFA guys a lot better. Yeah. Into the top 10. And people might be surprised because I think this would be the low spot for Tyler Locklear, but I'll kind of make my, my case here. And then I'm, I'm interested to see, you know, what, what you have to say, Jack on, you know, as it pertains to Locklear, but Locklear first baseman, second round pick in, in 2022, just put up silly numbers before getting hurt. I mean, just really, really good numbers before taking a pitch off of the hand and, and he broke a bone there. Uh, but I have some concerns with the swing. I'll get into that. Let's start with like the positives, big time power. I mean, we're talking 106.5 mile per hour, 90th percentile exit velocity gets into it in games pretty well. Uh, this is a dude that has a pretty patient approach as well, uh, which hedges some of the hit tool concerns. He's kept the strikeout rate in check in high a, but I'll nerd out about the swing in a little bit. There's some things with the swing that, lead me to believe that he, he may struggle against more advanced pitching. And I just can't project him as a regular until he shores up some of those things. So I just see big, strong man. He's six one, but he's built, he's built like a six one fire hydrant. You typically say fire hydrant for guys that are five ten or below. And, and they're like thick cut stocky guy, like Jose Altuve fire hydrant. Cause he's a strong guy at five foot six. 
Locklear is built like a tree trunk at six one. Um, yeah. Makes sense that he's made the move from third to first. So if you look at him as a true first baseman, where do you stand on him? Is he a top five prospect in the system? I'm not sure. If you look at him as a like a combo corner infielder, like many people did with Vientos, then uh, then all of a sudden he's top five. But he is a first base DH type, yeah. probably. Yeah. Um, the numbers are undeniable at VCU and in Everett this year. Like it's hard to look at those and say. Yeah, no, I don't buy it. Okay, <laughs> I, I buy it with with those statistical numbers, but it, lead me lead me to where your concerns are with the swing. Yeah, so for those that are watching on YouTube, you can kind of see that the home run swing we've got here, um, pitch that was actually out off the plate away, but the, and those are pitches he demolishes. There's a lot of movement to his swing, to his pre swing moves. You can kind of see like there's a loud barrel tip, a barrel wag, and it's very difficult to time up. There's also not a lot of negative movement. So his hands are out in front of him, kind of right in front of that shoulder, kind of almost by his chest. And there's not much of a negative movement to get those hands back. It kind of stays out in front of him. And I queued up just velocity. I queued up 93 plus. The second I saw that, that the hand path, I was like, let's see velocity. Sometimes guys are freaks and they can, they're fine. And when I see that, I'm like, okay, my concerns erased. I queue up velocity and uh, it, it was a little rough. Against 93 plus this season before hitting the IL, 690 OPS. Um, and, and you could just see how difficult it was for him to time. And also, like, he does get away with, with the, the barrel tip and kind of the disruptive moves because he does turn the barrel so quickly, meaning like getting it from upright to level, you know, and, and, and you know, parallel to home plate. Yeah. But with that same notion, those moves are really hard to time. Your hands being there, it's really hard to get in on, on those hard pitches running in on your hands. And pretty much you look at every single ball that he hit with authority, it was out over the plate away. He really struggled inside. I think more advanced pitching is going to go hard inside, tie him up, and, I mean, he's going to see a lot more 93-plus. If he makes some adjustments, I think he can be really solid because, again, the barrel turn is really impressive. His hands work well. The fact that he's able to produce with these moves – I think says a lot, but again, I think he's going to get picked apart a little bit against upper level competition with these moves as they currently stand. So I don't, when I, when I think like a hey, barrel straight up, almost like it is here. Um, I, I immediately go to Matt Olson, who is like the most pronounced barrel straight up move, but Matt Olson has so much of that negative movement yep. where it's, say, it's look at where he is at come back and then it's fire. Mm -hmm. So, that's how he has gotten so good against fastballs. Matt Olson slugging 600 against fastballs this year. Um, so I don't know. Like, it doesn't have to be quick cock back and then fire. It can be something slow like Olson. So I, I don't know. I see what you're talking about here, where his hands are just out in front of him the entire time. And, and the fact that the fact that he can hit balls with that much authority from that spot is really impressive and a testament to just his pure physical strength. That's exactly what I said on the wrap up of the, of the, of the write up. I said the flip side is luckily or matched to a near 1000 OPS and, and 50 high a games, despite swing inefficiencies. And there's no doubt about the ability to tap into power in games, but you know, 46% ground ball rate. That's partly because again, he gets crowded and you know, I, I the harder the pitches were the, the higher the ground ball rate. And it just results in, in, in kind of just this tied up swing on anything inside but again, with the right tweaks, he could be in a, in, in a really good spot and, and could end up going nuclear. But I, I'm interested to see how, how those moves work against better pitching uh, and, and see how it goes. But he could be a guy that kind of defies you know, what we look for in the swing and ultimately is pretty darn good. Number nine, Emerson Hancock. Uh, this is someone that I know you have been a fan of since his days at Georgia. He's a big league arm, no doubt about it. But you know he's not that top 100 arm. We, we thought he once would be fastball is more 93, 95 instead of the 96, 97, 98 that, you know, we were kind of sold out of college. And then there's just not really that, that out pitch. He's got the above average cutter. He's got a change up that flashes above average, but is incredibly inconsistent. What has stood out to me of late, he's put together some really good starts of late and he's pitching in a tough league in the Texas league is that the fastball command has been really good. And he's been, been able to dot east, west, north, south. And as you'll see in the video, like this is one here that we put up here against the Tulsa Drillers where it's just 
top quadrant of the zone, like top outside part. And he was just picking at those the last couple starts. It was pretty impressive what I saw. Fastball is his best pitch, but you know, there, there's just not a lot to dream on here. I feel like high probability, big league arm, but also, you know, relatively low ceiling. So three starts in July so far this year, or three starts in July so far this month. He'll make one more start in July. Um, first start in July, inning in two thirds, nine hits, nine earned runs. Next two starts in July, 13 innings, four hits, no runs, one walk, 14 Ks. So I don't know, maybe he kicked it into high. Maybe he got like a fire lit under his ass after an inning in two thirds and nine earned. I like Hancock because I don't know. It, it almost looked like he could pitch in the big leagues. The it next did day at Georgia. Yep. Um, but he, I think he battled that, injuries too. Sorry to cut you off, but like that's something that like I think has kind of diminished the stuff a little bit. Yeah, and and I think with with Hancock, what you saw is like multiple pitches. He was confident in zone with it. It's much easier to be confident in college. I know it's the SEC. I know that's the gold standard of college baseball, but it's so much easier to be confident in the SEC than it is in high A and double A in professional baseball. Like just yeah. fact there. Like Skeens, I don't think Skeens is ever going to nibble. But Skeens was more dominant at LSU than he will be in the pros. It, yeah, that's that's a fair thing to say, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, dude, like Strasburg was more dominant at San Diego State. So Hancock, you see these dominant pitchers. It's because they're working with supreme confidence. What does Hancock look like when he doesn't have supreme confidence? I'm just a little worried about him nibbling as he, like, climbs levels. I, I do want to see this guy, like, throw this year in double, maybe get up to triple at the end start the year in triple, gain confidence there, and then you get him to the big leagues. But, you know, those aren't like the top five prospects in an organization. The yeah. top five prospects in an organization, you can throw at any level and they're going to figure that shit out. Yeah. So I think Hancock just needs a little bit more time than some others. It, my, my issue with him, though, is just like kind of like he has to be pretty locked in to be good. And if, if he's not locked in, you'll see that that first start of the month, as you mentioned, he's got to be pretty, pretty, I wouldn't say perfect, but he's got a spot real well with the fastball. There's not that plus out pitch. The cutter is above average, slightly above average. The changeup has moments, but he's landed at first strike 47% of the time this year. So unless he really finds that changeup, it's hard to see anything more than kind of a number four ceiling. So 18 starts this year. 11 of those 18 starts, he has allowed one earned run or no earned runs. But he also has outings, speaking to your point, of nine earned runs, six earned runs, seven earned runs, and nine earned runs. Yep. Massive blowups, but more often than not, he's going to give you a one-run outing or a shutout outing. In double A, which, you know, in the big leagues, you'd say that's you know, maybe a quality start. Um, that screams like a four to me, like a good four. Yeah, I think so. Which is solid. That's fine. Um, mm -hmm. I think he could be a trade chip, too, if the, if the Mariners decide they want to go out and make a move. Michael Arroyo was a fun die for me. Number eight, second baseman, uh, international free agent, definitely a guy with a somewhat cap ceiling, given that he's 5'8", 175 pounds and limited to second base. But this dude can swing it way more juice than you'd expect from a guy that's 5'7", 5'8", and 18 years old, but very advanced of a hitter. And has put up great numbers in, in low A this year. Good contact rate. 90th percentile exit velocity of 104, 105 miles an hour, which is really impressive because usually guys that have 90th percentiles in that range, they're popping some, you know, 109s, 110s. He doesn't. He, his, his max exit velocity is 107. But it shows you how frequently he's just barreling baseballs and hitting balls hard. There's not a big difference from his average exit velocity and his max and 90th percentile, which just means – He's consistently barreling baseballs. He's, he's just fun. There's like some Donovan Solano to him here. Uh, but like the, the the good finished product Solano. Yeah. It's fun. Wow. What a what a non-sexy comp. We're talking about the eighth prospect in a like mess system. So <laughs> I know. Um no, it's it's incredibly impressive. Wow, my iPad just made sound. I don't know why. Um it's incredibly impressive that he's already off the complex at 18 years old. He's three and a half years younger than the average hitter at low A this year. Like what? Yeah, that's impressive. 18 years old at low A. 
15 punch outs and 96 plate appearances so far this year. That is more than palatable for an 18 year old at low A. So I get at this point, I'm just impressed that he's like not drowning in low A. So yeah. if you're not drowning as an 18 year old in low A, I'm, I'm excited for you. Yeah. And I will say like, I'm, I'm curious to see how much juice there is there. I, again, it's never going to be plus, but I think there's a chance for average power, which would be more than Donovan Solano. So uh, I think it could be better than, than him, obviously. But I think that that's kind of like the, the median outcome here, which is, you know, a, a big league, a big league role player. For He's sure. a $1.4 million international free agency. He got a, a good chunk of change here, but I think that the, there's some offensive upside to dream on. He could be a bat first second baseman that's you know capable of hitting 15 plus homers and gets on base at a good clip. And all of a sudden that's a sneaky above average regular. So uh, there, there's upside here enough to, to be an above average regular. And you know, it's hard to argue against what he's done already at his age, as you mentioned, as a younger player at that level. For sure. Number seven is a guy that was recently drafted as well. <laughs> we get to the second of the three picks. It's Johnny Farmello and Farmello outfielder 29th overall pick in this year's draft. This was a fun dive because he's an interesting profile flies. I mean, it's all about the speed. That's the, the, the biggest selling point with Farmello is the speed, but the field of hit was impressive. He's stronger than most of his peers. Like most 18 year old draftees are not six to 200 plus pounds. And you look at his forearms, like he's a strong dude. But his moves in the box are geared for contact. Its hands are pretty much starting where they fit, fit like where they're going to be slotted. It's toe tap for timing, throw the hands forward. It's it's very very simple and contact oriented. He's strong enough to where that turns into gap to gap power, and it seems like he's gap to gap power and burner with a good approach that works. But with some pre swing adjustments, he could tap into more power. But maybe that's not the the profile. Maybe the profile is above average hit, plus speed, good defense and center, and enough power. You know, average power or or doubles power. Regardless, this is an interesting guy and a fun a fun player to to grab here and with your second pick at the draft. You know who it feels like? Feels very hassle. Yeah, very hassle. Where hassle is a really good athlete, and you thought, okay, this guy can and will tap into more power, but he's not, you know, geared to do that. Like he'll just get, you know, he'll get more power as he gets stronger. I think that's how I feel about Farmello where like, if he doesn't change the swing at all, as he finalizes the stages of puberty, when he gets to high a or double a, I, I think that this guy can have, you know, 10 to 15 Homer power, but right now it's, it's speed and it's defense and center field. It, this feels super hassle out of the draft. Which is interesting too, because you know he's definitely stronger than Hassel. So I'm really interested to see like the the EVs like presently stronger, but they both have the similar frame, and we're like waiting for Hassel to add it, waiting for Hassel to add it, and yeah, you know, we're, we're still kind of waiting. We're waiting on a lot of things from Robert Hassel, unfortunately, right now. But he's faster than him too. Like he's a really explosive athlete. So it's going to be fun to see how Farmelo develops. I think this was relatively high for a recently drafted guy, and the reason why we have him here is it's already looking like he's a high probability big leaguer relative to most high school guys you're going to draft, right? Like you look at the swing, it looks geared for a lot of contact and it should translate pretty quickly. He posts elite home to first time. So this is a guy that like, even if it doesn't all come together offensively, he can chop balls into the ground and, and beat them out to first. Like there's a high floor here. There's a really good chance at a fourth outfielder in kind of a low end scenario. And I think there's, there's a lot to dream on as an everyday center fielder, who can hit for average, get on base at a good clip. I was really impressed with the takes and the approach from what I was able to see. And again, if he grows into average power, then you really have an exciting player here. Even if the power is fringy, there's an above average regular role. So without that much pressure on the, on the power, I, I like what I like the profile here. I like the different outcomes. I th think there's a lot of different ways where Farmelo can be a big leaguer. Is it fair to assume he's not going to K much at all? I think it's very fair to assume that. And of course, now that we say that he's like going to have no barrel malleability. No, it's Austin Hendricks. He's going to yeah, swing over every breaking it. ball, but no, I really don't think he's going to punch out much. And that's the thing. It's like with that kind of speed, I'm fine with that. We can wait on the power in the big leagues. That's fine. That's what Christian Yelich did. For like, sure. Like I'm fine with that. For sure. Yeah. Get to number six. This is a guy I wanted to put out higher so bad, Jack. 
I, I, I fought myself. I, I wanted to have him so much higher, and I just can't. Jonathan Class A, outfielder, he's in double A, signed for $35,000 back in 2018. He's a switch hitter. Talk about a burner. This dude flies. You and I watched him together at the Futures game. I've watched as much video on this guy as anybody in the system because I want to put him higher, but it's so damn hard because I don't have a lot of confidence in the approach and the hit tool. We got a 35 on the hit tool presently. I'm hoping for a 40 to 45, but the raw power is above average. He gets into it in games because we'll get into the launch angle in a second. It's, it's actually comical. Um, and you saw it with me. His jumps in center field, even in, in, in limited action in the Futures game, that speed translates out there. I, I think people that have any questions about him in center field are, are, are off base there. He's fun as fuck. <laughs> like He's so much fun. Now, does fun translate to really good? Most of the time it does. Like Tatis was fun as hell. Acuna was fun as hell. I'm thinking Corbin Carroll was fun as hell. I don't want to like put Class A in that, but Class A is... He's got what tw- he's going to hit 20 homers this year between high A and double. He's going to swipe 70 bags this year <laughs> between high A and double. He just sells out for so much lift, dude. I, I, I told you this was a specific write up that I, you know, there's certain ones. I, I, I don't, I try not to bug you too much because, you know, we, we're talking about these prospects all the time and you're, you're usually the one that edits a lot of the write ups and things like that. But this was one where I was like, dude, I, I think I went off on this one. I'm going to need you to read this because like, I, I, I want to get your thoughts. And I dove into to launch angles. Uh, and I'm not a huge, huge, huge launch angle guy because I think you know you can look at the swing and I feel like I can kind of just gather what I need to gather with the, the launch angles, the results. I can kind of gather what I need to gather before that. But I, I was like, this might be the, the most steep launch angle you know, that, that there is in the, in, in the minor leagues. I was only able to compare it to big leaguers because I can't do like a leaderboard of the minor leagues. There's nobody with a 23 degree launch angle. <laughs> There's just not like you can see the hitch in his load. And I think that also kind of disrupts his timing a little bit. It's hitching the load with his hands. And then it's like, he's swinging straight up and it really leaves him susceptible to, to elevated stuff. I- I've never really seen a 23 degree launch. I can't think of one that I've seen like that. And I think it makes it really hard for him to consistently hit, which I'm cool with the power. Like you can sell out for it a little bit, but dude, you're you're a 70 runner. You're gonna have 70 bags, like like you said, Jack. Like it doesn't have to all be sell out for hitting the ball in the air. Like mix in some some ground balls. That's okay. 33% ground ball rate when you're that fast. Like you better hit the ball more consistently. And and he doesn't. You said 23 degrees. Yeah. Okay. Minimum 100 batted ball events at the major league level. The three guys that are above him, or two guys that are above him, are Joey Gallo at 29 degrees. I think we know what Joey Gallo does. And Wilmer Flores at 26 degrees. At 22.9 is Jack Sawinski, Chris Taylor at 22.6, Cedric Mullins at 22.2, and Max Muncy at 22 flat. Yeah. Like, Class A is an exponentially better athlete than all those guys combined. (laughs) Like, Sawinski's a good athlete, but Sawinski... I, Sawinski does sell out for pop. Sawinski is homers and stolen bases. That's but that's kind of like who he is because he, he can't. I don't think he's going to hit enough. And exactly. maybe that's what Class A is. I guess like what Class A yeah. is lightning fast. Sawinski can motor, but Class A is a different beast. I agree. I agree. I agree. And like so Mullins, like, you can you can say that that's a little steep for Mullins, but Mullins has a, a, an unbelievable feel to hit. So yeah. like he's also spraying baseballs. Like Class A, it's average contact rates so and maybe slightly below average you know who's got a high one surprisingly mookie betts has a 21 degree average launch angle talk about another guy who has the most absurd feel for the barrel though yeah you you know like so it's if you have an absurd feel for the barrel then you know i'm not gonna harp on it too much but when when you're a little stiff and you're that steep it's you're selling out for homers like joey gallo that's fine because that's all joey gallo is at this point with, with some defense, but that's the frustrating part for me with, with class a, because it just leaves him so susceptible to pitches, you know, up and, and, and it makes it hard to just consistently make contact. That said, he, he taps into his power now in games because anything that's, you know, middle down or that he times up well, that's elevated, he crushes it. 
But man, like I just I would love to see a little bit of a flatter swing because like we mentioned, we know how fast he is and how good he can be if he just, you know, kind of makes a little bit more contact. I have it queued up, by the way. I always look from 33 inches and above, mm-hmm. kind of like how guys are producing up there. Um, and, and, you know, most of the, the best hitters either demolish balls up there or don't swing at balls up there. Class A with his, with his you know, angle, it's pretty much pretty impossible to hit balls consistently up there. 190 on pitches 33 inches and above, which is the top third of the zone. He's hitting 190 with a 317 slug and a 33% K rate and a 34% in zone whiff. If he adjusts this, though, like he's 21, he's extremely young still. If he adjusts this, he he could easily be an, an elite prospect. But it's just it's just there's so much variance here. I don't know where to peg this guy, and I moved him like five times. So the other guy that jumps out to me, like it feels very Chris Bryant, and we know Chris By- Bryant's blue zones when he was first coming oh, up. Yeah. Like this guy won an MVP with a drastic blue zone at the top of the zone because he hammered everything belt and below. Like we talk about Trout, but I think KB is a great example because he found his way. We just talked about this on the Just Baseball show. Like that guy swung his free agent deal by $100 million in 2021 because that launch angle lowered a little bit and he covered a little bit more of the zone because the game adapts. Yep. If Class A can like just level it out a little bit and drop it to 15 degrees or like, I don't know, just say I'm going to hit doubles instead of I'm going to hit homers. He's still going to hit some homers. And, and that's the, the last thing I'll say on Class A is Chris Bryant, a dude, good EVs, right? Class A is a 101.5 90th percentile exit velocity guy. That is average, like the definition of average. He's in the Texas League, ball flies, he's lifting it in the air, those will get out. That's not going to translate as much. There will be a lot of flyouts at the big league level, and now you're giving away, you know, hits those could have been line drives in the gap you sold out for power didn't get all of it and now it's you know fly out to the track so he's 21 there's adjustments to be had and he's still a really good prospect but we spent more time on him because i think he could be special but he could also be so frustrating he just never puts it together in the upper levels no that that's the word like the f word that it's frustrating because it's untapped right now and like we we know what he's got to do to tap it Yep, 100%. 100%. Cole Emerson at number five, their first pick of the three first rounders. Emerson was a guy that a lot of video available, and and I really was able to to understand why the Mariners like him because the top one of the top prospects in the Mariners system is cut from a very similar cloth in in Cole Young. Uh, but you have you have somebody in Cole Emerson here, smooth swing from the left side, good athlete. I really was impressed with the actions at shortstop. And I think I saw some saying, oh, he might move to second. I feel like everyone just says that automatically now. Uh, th- maybe it happens. I-, I, From what I saw, I think he's got a great shot to stick it short. Arms so, above average. Actions were good. Feet were good. And I'll get to the, the, the hit tool in a second. But I just want to get that out of the way. Like, I will get a guy that should have every opportunity to stick it short. So I think Colt Emerson is right under the threshold of – second base compared to third base so any prep shortstop if they are under 6-1 or under 200 <laughs> pounds they're going to move to second base yes if they are 6-1 or over or 200 pounds or bigger they're going to move to third base yes yes so it's, it's, it's it's insane i feel like we 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 are moving guys off too quick i know it's really hard to stick it short but i think we've almost gone too far the other way um yeah. it, it's wild but anyway emerson a lot of similarities to young and this is why i think I, this is why i think they loved him I see a plus hit tool potentially talk about feel for the barrel that uh, talk about swing ma- malleability. And that is if the pitch is up, down, in, out, or breaks more than I thought, can I adjust the barrel after the launch? And he can really adjust. I watch him spray balls the other way. I watch him turn on stuff middle in. Uh, I watch him get to elevated. I watch him get, you know, throw his hands at pitches when he was fooled. Emerson has the potential to be a plus hitter. Then you have a frame where I think there's there's room to add a little bit more strength. He's a little twitchy. I think there's average power here. He's an above average runner. It's just solid tools across the board. These guys get overlooked because they don't have that that plus tool. I think the hit tool is going to end up being the plus tool. But man, like a lot of good big leaguers are plus hit, average or better across the board the other ways, and they're really good big leaguers. And I think that's exactly what Cole Emerson can be. 
He just screams ball player. Like yeah. honestly, just watching the the clips that I saw on YouTube and Twitter and and all that stuff, it seems like he has fun playing the game. And this is like the purest version of playing the game as as you get in the showcase era of yeah. prep baseball. Yeah. Um, and, and I can really appreciate that. They ID'd that with Cole Young. Cole Young still looks like that. Holiday still looks like that. Yep. You find a high schooler that loves that looks like he loves playing baseball. Take him. Take yeah. him. Take him. Take him. Especially when they make it look easy, and, and Emerson does exactly that. Yes. Moving into number four, talk about a guy with a lot of helium. It's well timed because he is putting up monster numbers. Gabriel Gonzalez, outfielder in High A now, recently promoted. Jack, this is where I want you to cook on the Fangraphs numbers. Uh, he has just gotten better and better as the year has gone on. I've I've seen some write ups and some evaluations on Gonzalez that that I think oversell the power, and that's my one detraction here is he's six foot 225 pounds but the evs are kind of iffy but he is still young and i can still turn into more you know man strength as he gets older and the field of hit is phenomenal i mean the contact rates are great even though the chase is a little high the zone contact rate has gotten better and better and better as the years gone on talk about a guy that has a feel for the barrel the, the mariners identify these dudes so if it sounds like i'm repeating myself it's because it's there's a theme through through the system here they identify guys who have a feel for the barrel and can adjust to different locations. Those watching on YouTube can see, like, he's getting to a pitch down and in, 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 breaking late, and and putting a good swing on it. I, I try to queue up the best pitches possible because I can, like, queue it up by spin rate. I can queue it up by movement. And then I want to see the swings they get off on these 60, 70 grade pitches. And Gonzalez just continues to get good swings off on those pitches. He gets up to high A, and he's been going nuts, Jack. So average ISO is probably what, like 115, 120? Believe so. That's the yeah, one I, stat I just like always forget what the baseline is. I, th I think the big league average isolated power is somewhere around like 130, 135. And I think at the minor league level, it drops to like 120. So let, let's just chalk it up as 120 as average. I'm going to run you through WRC plus K rate and isolated power by stop. 2021 in the Dominican Summer League. 141 WRC plus 16% K rate isolated power at 234, which is elite 2022 at the complex state side eight or uh, 35 games, a 163 WRC plus 15% K rate, a 190 isolated power. Well above average low way in 2022. Once he got off the complex 116 WRC plus 14% K rate, 103 isolated power. K rate still elite, WRC plus still well above average. Now this year, 73 games in Modesto. He like repeated his last stop. He played 32 games last year, 73 games this year. 146 WRC plus, 14% K rate, 182 isolated power. And then nine games so far in high A Everett, a 168 WRC plus through 44 plate appearances, a 16% K rate, in a 410 isolated power already has five pumps in his first nine games. This guy is hit at every single level. His bad stop is a 116. Regardless of level, his previous worst was in the Dominican Summer League where he put up a 141 WRC plus. Yeah, he he just hits and I, I'm the the one question I have is, you know, how much power is in there long term? Seems like a lot. <laughs> it, it seems like it but the EVs, you know, it's like 102 mile per hour, 90th percentile. The max is like 108, 109. But he's, but, but he's 19. Number three, the guy that's recently promoted. And, you know, I, I got made fun of because I was hyping up Brian Wu. I know he's technically graduated now. I said he, this guy's, you know, this is a great, great move for them. I think he's going to succeed. He's going to find a way. And then, of course, he gets the, the Texas Rangers who knock him around. Everyone's like, yeah, I want him hyping up a prospect again. He struggles. How about Wu since then? What is what has Brian Wu done since then, Jack, before I nerd out about VAA? Uh, he's done really well, Aram. He has dominated with a fastball. Brian Wu, so far, to open his big league career, uh, as I cue this fucker up yeah brian Wu, um nine starts a four nine era 54 punch outs 13 walks in 44 innings last five starts five innings one earned six innings two earned six innings one earned 
blow up three and a third against Minnesota, but then six innings, four earned, seven Ks, and one walk. So so Wu has been really solid. Yeah. And and what makes him so solid is I mean, dude, <laughs> he releases the fastball from as low of a vertical attack angle as you're going to find. And, and this is something that we've talked a lot about. It's what makes Bryce Miller so good. And it's also what makes Brian, Brian Wu so good. And it's funny because I, I just realized I'm, I'm sharing my screen while looking for a bookmark on specific uh, VAA leaderboards. But um, when you look at, at what Wu is able to do, and I got I to gotta queue up that leaderboard and, and plug that for some folks because I think they'll really enjoy this. It's big leagues only, but it's a good yeah. reference point. Wu's VAA is right around 3.8 on the fastball. Elite is considered negative four. He's about negative 3.7, negative 3.8. And I kind of put this in, in context here. That's lower than any qualified starter in the major leagues. And that's why I knew he was going to have success right away. I got the, the, the minor league VAA. I go look at the big leagues. And there's nobody that was, was below three, negative 3.8. That's right where Joe Ryan is. And I compare the fastball shapes. Fastball shape's right on par with Joe Ryan. Velocity is actually a, a tick above. And I'm like, all right, this fastball is going to play. And I watch it. You, you see it play. You see the numbers. It, it played. Off of that, though, it's just really good command and a lot of confidence. And it, when you have that low of a release point, you can see on the video here, just like it's so loose. The arm just kind of swings from this kind of three-quarters low release point. It's a lot like Joe Ryan. But then the slider is, is solid. What's interesting is he mixes in a sinker now and that sinker has given him another look. And that's, what's really cool is he doesn't just have to get whiffs at the top of the zone. He throws you this sinker that gets you ground balls. And now you're just thinking about something running up at you. That looks like it's starting low. And then something running down that looks like it's starting a little higher. And then he mixes in the slider. He's very unique in that respect. Cause you don't see guys with a, with a low VAA throwing sinkers, but he does both. And then he mixes in the slider. Wu's kind of an outlier guy that's hard to prepare for. I think that's what makes him really tough. He's not just your typical high spin, low release fastball guy. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to cue up exactly where he's releasing this. Yes. And I got it. So take a gander. Can you see it? All right. Yeah. Let me, let me, uh, for the YouTube folks, let me remove my, uh, the, the share screen for a second. So this is where he's releasing the baseball. He's releasing it probably, I don't know, letter high from where he starts if he's fully upright. And look at the extension. Yes. Like, he is so far down on the mound, and he's so whippy. Like, there's not a, a, a stocky pitcher. There's not a big-bodied pitcher that can do this. Yep. In order to do this at such a good angle, you have to have the build of a Joe Ryan, of a Brian Wu, where you are lanky, you are athletic, and you know how to use your lower half exceptionally well. This guy was probably told when he was 15 or 16 years old, hey, pitching starts with the lower half. And he took that and ran with it. And so he's like, okay, I'm going to get as far down on the mound with my legs as I possibly can. I'm going to use as much lower body as I possibly can. And I'm going to let my whippy arm action take me to such a unique spot. Joe Ryan, Scherzer, Brian Wu. Those are the three best examples of that. A hundred percent. And you know, that's why Scherzer's a hall of famer is he pairs elite stuff across the board with that Ryan and, and Wu have good, pretty good stuff. And it just shows you how much the release point can make a difference. Last thing I'll say is from that release point, if you can like make a mental note, think about the ball either going up or down from there, a tunneling nightmare for, for hitters, you know, from, from that point. So I'm a big Wu guy. I think he's going to be consistently good at the big league level and, I think this is just another development masterclass here from from the, the Mariners pitching department and and very similar to Bryce Miller. I think he'd be better than Bryce Miller. I think he might be better than Bryce Miller, to be honest. Yeah. I think it's more unique. Well, and and he's he might not be as fastball dependent as Bryce Miller. Bryce Miller is as fastball dependent, more fastball dependent, than at least not as driver. four seam dependent, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Which is huge. Huge. Because I almost don't even consider it fastball dependent when you're using a sinker as well. It's almost like a I think of almost like a power change up because it's what it's doing for him. Yeah. Well, especially now that we are in the era of high velocity change ups too, sinker can almost profiles like a change up. Let's get to the top two. People might be surprised here. Jack, were you surprised with the final final here? I know we talked about it when we make these decisions together, but like this was the one last where I was like, I changed my mind. 
I've seen yeah. enough. Yeah, we'll get I to was the surprised. reason why number one is number one, but number two is Harry Ford. Yeah, I was very surprised. Um, we've talked about Harry Ford a lot, and this is the most athletic catcher in the minor leagues. He immediately comes up and like is Varsho, right? It's it's catcher with the ability to play center field and probably play it at a very high level. But Ford, like you see the athleticism behind the dish, and with how available looks have been on Harry Ford, I think it's almost like industry consensus that he's the best because we've seen him in the futures game and we've seen him in the world baseball classic. And like, it feels like a lot of baseball fans, non Mariners fans know Harry Ford's name when they don't know number one's name. Yep. Yep. And that's why I'm really excited to talk about it, but we'll, we'll, we'll highlight Ford first. You know, we've talked a lot, a lot about him, so we won't spend as much time on Ford as, as, as you know, young, but the, the, there's a few things here that I'm looking at and, of course, you're getting the athletic catcher that can play center field and, and all of that good stuff, but we haven't seen him play center field yet. He's, he's a good, pretty good catcher. He's made improvements there, but I don't know how much upside. Like the thing with Dalton Varsho is before this year, 20 plus homers, mashing baseballs. I need to see a little bit more offensive. And this is splitting hairs. Remember, Harry Ford's a top 50 prospect. And I hope that doesn't come off the wrong way. He's 20 years old. He has an elite approach. He's put the bat on ball pretty consistently. And he doesn't strike out. He walks a ton. I'm just wondering how much offensive upside there is to dream on here. Where, where, how do you feel about that question? Um, I think it's totally valid. And I think that, I don't know. We, we were kind of having this conversation about Andy Rodriguez. We had FaceTime last yes, night. Very um, similar. Yeah. Like I, I think it's high probability we, big. Yeah. But we probably got carried away about all-star potential offensively. Yeah. I think Andy probably has a higher probability of tapping into those all-star production type numbers offensively where Andy could legit hit 290 with 25 homers. But I think Andy's probably a 270 to 280 with 15 to 20 homers. Mm-hmm. That's probably what Ford is. Yeah. And Ford's going to walk. Ford's going to steal bases like JT Real Muto. He's not going to be one of the more prolific base stealers in baseball, but he's going to have the threat for 15 bags as a catcher, which is crazy. Yeah. I would sign up for that 10 days out of 10. Um, but Ford, like, it's probably not like, oh, wow, we're looking at a 900 OPS for Harry Ford. That's probably not him. Exactly. And, and that's part of the reason why I you know, slight, slight knockdown. It's just like 90th percentile is a hair under 102. The max exit velocities are kind of meh. How much projection is there? We saw Harry. He's smaller than I thought. I, I, 5'10 might be generous. Like, is, is 5'10 not a little generous there on, on, the, on the measurement? I'm not sure. I haven't stood next to him. Like they, we were in the hotel. The I, when we were in the hotel at the Futures game, I was like, Ugh. like, I, and then watching him in, in the box, like it's a good field to hit overall, but you know, the contact rates are actually slightly below average. The slug hasn't totally been there. So I think he's going to walk. I think yeah. he's going to hit enough. I think there's going to be doubles power, but if he's not a good, good catcher, then you know where are you getting the war? Yeah, you know, where are you getting the the the, the value? And that's where I, like I want to see him kind of. I would say break out in one aspect of his game a little bit, but again, the approach gives him a really good floor, and so does the athleticism. Yeah, what do you think? What do you think the breakout aspect could be? Also, before you answer that question, I think the guys that jumped out to me in terms of just size when we were at the hotel for the futures game before they left, James Wood is somehow bigger than I expected. <laughs> hey, um, seven four. Merrill's. Merrill's big Jackson mm-hmm. Merrill with the Padres is a big guy Andy Rodriguez I knew was sneaky big I think you saw that he was sneaky big like I think a lot of people would think oh yeah he's six foot no like that guy's like a pretty big catcher um Heston Kerstad is a bit smaller than I was yeah expecting him to be. yeah Jackson Holiday was a bit bigger than I expected him to be yeah it's just the face the the face makes you feel yeah, like no, I mean like, I well. I thought he was gonna be 410 and, and 90 pounds but not the face <laughs> No, so t- t- to answer your question, like, of course, he's never going to hit for as much power as like a Will Smith or or be that kind of guy. Uh, but I-, I think that where you see him maybe really stand out will be just in the on base department. If the hit tool tra- like you know continues to translate closer to the fifty five, the approach is so damn good that he could be a guy that gets on base in the high three hundreds. And if you're doing that as a catcher with speed uh, and running into at least average power, that's 
pretty awesome. Yeah. Getting number one, Cole Young. And mark my words, you know, we, we talked about Roman Anthony and how he was going to go nuclear a, a couple like a couple weeks ago. And he, oh my gosh, did he go nuclear? I don't think Cole Young has like the nuclear potential, but I think he's going to just continue to mash so much at such a young age and be so advanced that I think you're going to see this guy fly up ranks very soon. Shortstop could move to second. This is a guy that could move to second. I don't really care. This isn't my comp, but it is such a good comp. I think a lot of scouts have thrown it out. I think I've seen Baseball America mention it in a write-up on him too. Daniel Murphy. This guy screams Daniel Murphy, uh, which I think is obviously a very, very good player. And I think he's got a, like a little bit more, a little bit more juice consistently like Murphy had the flashes of it I think you know he will consistently tap into average or better juice the thing that really put me over the top with Cole Young is well, one the swing is is absolutely gorgeous uh two the approach is ahead of his years again this is what the Mariners do they ID guys that just don't expand the zone uh, besides the exceptions like you know Gabby Gonzalez was a little aggressive um and class a but they signed him for thirty thousand dollars doesn't expand the zone. Really good feel to hit. It's, it, it's an easy plus hit tool. Potentially better than that. Sneaky power to the pull side is what really put me over the top here. This guy's popped multiple 110s. For a 19-year-old who looks like he should have fringy power at best, multiple 110s this year, is that's better than Gabby Gonzalez, who's 225 pounds. That's better than some of the other guys we're talking about here. Way better than Harry Ford in terms of the power. But he doesn't need to have power to be good. He drives the ball to all fields. I sent you a video of a double he hit straight over the center fielder's head at 107. Yeah. Change up down and just crushes it. He gets to pitches in all different locations. He walks a ton. He hits the ball hard enough. I think he's going to tap into some more juice. I think the defense is fine at short. He might be stretched a little thin there. He could be a, a, an a, almost elite defensive second baseman if, if they wanted, but I still think he could play a good short. I, I'm a big fan of his game all the way around. If he can even hit 15, 12 to 15 home runs, He's going to hit for average. He's going to walk. He's going to play good defense. And he's going to sneaky steal a couple bags. So not often do you get to call a guy that pops multiple 110s smooth, but that's exactly what he is. When you when you see a 19-year-old popping 110s, typically they, I don't know, look like Wood or Yankee L. Fernandez. And Wood is smooth. But, I'm, I mean, it's typically like big men that, you know, can, can – rip through the zone and it looks you know very like station to station yep cole young is like buttery mm -hmm. and if buttery can result in 110 miles an hour you've got something really special going and, and that's what i love is like that's the a swing and like 2-0 count he's looking for something middle in he un uncorks that that swing for 108 109 that he's trying to get but then he can just flip his hands at a ball when he's down in the count <laughs> one and two and spray it the other way and I think the ability I, to understand both is exceptional and something that very few guys have. It's innate. And, and again, the Mariners ID those guys real well. He's walked more than he struck out this year. Eight homers, eight triples, 23 doubles. And I think there's more power to be tapped into there. The Daniel Murphy comp is just so spot on, and I think he's a little bit more athletic unless I'm forgetting the early days of Daniel Murphy. I don't think you're forgetting the early days of Daniel Murphy. Um, who did those come with? Did those come with the Mets? So Murphy and Murphy also had a yeah, you know, Murphy at 25 home runs when he I think by the time he's 30, like there's there's enough juice there to be like that. He was a late bloomer, of course. So we're talking about more of like the back end of the the Dan, the Mets era of Daniel Murphy. Murphy swiped 23 bags in 2013. That's crazy. I'm looking at that too. I think this comp is excellent. I think Young's gonna do it way longer, obviously, because he's gonna get to the big leagues before he's 23. He's probably Jeez. gonna be good in the big leagues before he's 26. Way to toot I, your own horn, Bob. I'm, I'm excited. I think this comp is perfect. Wow. Humble too. And it wasn't mine. I can't take credit. Who's, whose was it? I told you. I, I've, I've, I've seen it multiple times. Damn. Okay. I can't take credit for it. So you can't take credit for this one. You can't take credit for the, uh, for the Chase Davis cargo one either. <laughs> that, that one, that one I think should be like a basic test of fear. Like that should be like a vision test instead of like the, you know, the, the rows that are getting smaller and smaller. You put yeah. Cargo and Chase Davis together, and if you think those two swings look different at all, you fail the test. You can't drive legally. Well, Miguel Vargas and Alex Rodriguez, too. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but no, this is this is a really fun player. I think we'll be a top 35 prospect in our update, and 
get ready. The Cole Young train, the hype train, just watch. It's going to start rolling quite soon. Mm -hmm. That'll do it. Again, if you want to follow along, read along, link is in the podcast description. So subscribe on YouTube. Some exciting prospect interviews coming up. Very excited about that. Jack is going to be talking to some folks around the field, and you know, we'll be airing that on the YouTube and on you know the, the audio side of things too. Very excited about that as well. And the top 100 will be out the day after the trade deadline. Speaking of the trade deadline, go check out JustBaseball.com. We are churning out outlooks on every single team and what they may do at this deadline plus a lot more that'll do it for this episode as always thank you for listening we're going to be talking draft grades with you tomorrow to finally wrap up all of that draft coverage